everyone. Good to be with you again tonight. Let's go back to our study here in 1 Corinthians. We'll pick up in chapter 3, verse 5, but let's just kind of set the uh, stage for our thinking a little bit. It's been a few hours past since we were together last night. And clear a few cobwebs out. Remember, we looked at already in chapter 1 in the first nine verses, uh, particularly verses 4 through 9, the apostle uh, encourages these new Christians in Corinth. They've been only Christians for a few years by the time he writes this letter. And he mentions eight different privileges that are part of their new life in Christ. Uh, and particularly, he ends in verse 9 with the privilege of being brought into a partnership a sharing together in common with the very Son of God. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship or the partnership of his Son. But then he begins to deal with something that had been reported to him uh, by those of Chloe's household. We said not Chloe Rosidas, but uh, uh, Chloe there in Corinth, that uh, they were concerned about some of the things in the meeting. And this idea of contentions or divisions over exalting certain men. And I believe that what he that sets off what he deals with all the way through the end of chapter 4, verse 21. He's still dealing with that issue at the end of chapter 4. And he sees that as an opportunity to expose an area of weakness in the fellowship, in the believers, the dear believers there. And it's an area of weakness that uh, continues to plague believers down through the history of the church. And that is spiritual immaturity, not going on in growth. And uh, we were talking about that in the car on the way over here. The, Certain churches boast about 250 baptisms and so many people getting saved and this and that. Uh, but are those people going on for the Lord? Because it's not God's design that they would stay baby Christians for 40 or 50 or 70 years in this world. That's not God's design. And when the huge danger with not going on in growth is if you're not growing, it may be because you don't have the life. And if you don't have the life, you need to understand that self-deception is a very serious danger. You and I don't know how awful self is within us. If you spend time in the Word of God enough, you will begin to see that. And that's part of what spiritual growth is about. And so Paul, to me, in the genius of God working in Paul the instrument. Paul may have been a genius too. Many believe he was. But it's the word of God. It's the spirit of God working through him. And there's a flow of thought that moves, as he moves through it. And he begins with, uh, in chapter 1, that we, we've already seen this. This is rehearsal. In verse 18 with the message of the cross. You say, well, you, don't you want to lift these people up? Don't you want to build them up? Don't you want to encourage them? Don't you want to edify them? Why are you going to start with the message of the cross? That seems like a downer. I said, seems like a downer. But for those who are being saved, the message of the cross is the power of God unto salvation. And as we talked about on the Lord's Day, you don't want to make it go down more smoothly by decorating it or softening the impact of the cross when you're speaking to an unbeliever. Because God's design is that it would hit them with the conviction of the Holy Spirit and they would see how bad they are. You say, well, the, the Son of God, the perfect Holy One, He had to come and die on that cross. That seems so horrible. But that's what it took because of the holiness of God and your sinfulness and mine. It took that. And that ought to help us in self-distrust and self-renunciation. Because, as Romans 6 will tell us, we were crucified with Him, right? 
so that we might die to self and live to God. And so the message of the cross is so important in God's plan. And I think it's just amazing. Paul just launches right out and talks about the message of the cross and, and how it is because of the cross, we only boast in one man, right? Verse 30 and 31 of chapter one, but of him are you in Christ Jesus? He'll say in, in chapter three, uh, in verse 21, let no one boast in men. Stop this boasting in men. Stop it. It's, it's babyhood. No, Paul didn't die for you. Peter didn't die for you. Paulus didn't die for you. Whoever your favorite radio preacher is or whoever your favorite commentary writer is, he or she didn't die for you. Christ did. So let no one boast in men anymore. Let all our boasting and bragging be in Jesus Christ. That's what he says in verse 31 of chapter 1. And then he begins to, uh, in the beginning of chapter 2, talk about his own experience when he came to Corinth to plant this church, how he did not follow eloquence of speech. I don't think that means Paul was incapable of eloquence of speech. I think he could have been as eloquent as Apollos any day. That's my opinion. But he chose not to use eloquence of speech in giving the gospel so that he would not take the power away from the gospel. You see what he's saying? That the power of the gospel is in its message. It's not in how we decorate it or make it more palatable for people. It, the Bible tells us the cross is an offense to the world. So to an unbeliever, you're sharing the message, expect it to be, don't take it personal because you didn't die for him anyway. Christ did. He can take it personal. You don't have to take it personal. But when you share the message, you expect a little bit of a shock or a little pushback, right? I did that. We all probably did that when we first heard the message and realized my religion won't save me. My Sunday school attendance won't work. My Bible reading won't work. I needed, I needed a savior. I needed to see I was a sinner and I needed to see that God provided a savior and there's only one savior. And it isn't your favorite preacher. It's Jesus Christ. So that's what he's communicating to him. And then that moves it. You see the flow? He's trying to show them, or let me put it this way. He's trying to wean them off the bottle. <laughs> like you mothers do it with children as they're growing up. You don't want your teenager going to youth group and wanting to have, still be using a bottle. You want them to use their teeth, eat a pizza, eat a steak, right? Grow up. And, and that's what we want spiritually. So uh, and we would expect this to happen, right? Those of us who are growing in the Lord would, would know, well, not only the message of the cross needs to be brought out, but what else? Or maybe I should say, who else? You better bring in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly what he does. That's what we looked at last night. You see how it flows? He hits with the message of the cross and then it's, there's only one Lord, there's only one deliverer, there's only one message, there's only one foundation of the church, you'll say we'll see tonight, chapter 3. And there's only one Holy Spirit, and he was given in order for us to understand the purposes and plan of God in the whole doctrine of illumination. And this is the longest section here in chapter two in the Bible on the doctrine of spiritual illumination by the Holy Spirit. It's not his only ministry, but it's a large part of his ministry to do this. And let me say this, it is a characteristic of new covenant ministry to bring in the the work of the Holy Spirit. You know how I know that? Well, hold your finger here and go back to the Gospel of John. I know some of you are studying that in BSF. You could go back to John chapter 3. What was the message to Nicodemus in John chapter 3? Nicodemus, you need to be born again. And then he talks about 
the spirit. The wind blows where it listed, where it goes. If you can't see it, so it is with the work. Of, so the Lord's connecting the new birth with the ministry of the Holy Spirit in his message to Nicodemus. And he says, Nicodemus, you're a ruler of the people. You're one of the leading Old Testament teachers, and you don't know this? So that tells us that it's, it must be predicted in the Old Testament. And what passage, you should know these passages, what passage is he referring to? That Nicodemus should have known and expected the coming of the Holy Spirit. Well, the passages, the two main ones dealing with the new covenant, Jeremiah 31, and I think particularly in John 3, it's Ezekiel 36. I will give you a new heart and write my law within your heart. But then in chapter 7, that's why particularly in the Feast of Tabernacles, this is now just six months before our Lord's offering of himself on the cross. On the last day, verse 37, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, and he's talking about the Old Testament, and that's the scripture at that time, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Rivers of living water. He's speaking metaphorically, right? He doesn't mean there's going to be a literal flow of river coming out of your heart or your abdomen. And the next verse tells us that. John tells it. Now, John slips in in the story, and as the narrator, he says, But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given. Why? We need to understand this. This is part of the outworking of the plan of God. The Holy Spirit given in this way could not occur until the Lord Jesus had been glorified, which included his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, and then giving of the Holy Spirit. That's his glorification. And that's when we read in Acts chapter 2 that he gives the Holy Spirit. And then over a few pages more in chapter 14 in the Upper Room Discourse, some of the greatest information and truth regarding the ministry of the Holy Spirit is in John 14, 15, and 16. I'm just going to point to a couple of them here. In verse 15 of John 14, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. That word another is another of the same kind. There are two different words in the Greek. And this one is not another of a different kind, but another of the same kind, like Christ that he may abide with you until you sin the next time. Know what it says? Forever, it means forever. <laughs> abide with you. The spirit of truth, that's one of the names of the Holy Spirit, whom the world cannot receive. So you see the there's an exclusion statement there. Only born again people receive the Holy Spirit. The world can't receive him. Impossible. Not within the plan of God, you see. Because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you up to that point. He had dwelt through Jesus Christ's ministry with the body, had dwelt with them, and he will be future tense in you. That had never happened under the old covenant. It couldn't because Jesus had not been glorified, you see. And then there's more references to the Holy Spirit in verse 26 of chapter 14. We won't read that in chapter 15, but in chapter 16, verse 13, when the he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all, he should guide into all truth. That's exactly what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He teaches the word of God to us. That's why we pray and ask for illumination from him. He will guide you to all truth, but he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak his submission to the Father and to the Son. And he will tell you the future things to come, like in the book of Revelation, like in the book of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians and Hebrews and so many of them. And then verse 14, 
He will glorify himself through spiritual gifts. That's what we see in the ministry of Pentecostalism, in the charismatic movement. It's all glorifying the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is practically left out of it. Which tells us it's not of God. The Holy Spirit would never do that. Oh, I'll say there's a spirit at work, but it's not the Holy One. Danger, danger. You know people that are, and they're, they're around here. They're, up, they're around where I am down there. It's an opportunity to help people, help others to see it. Show them this verse. He will glorify Jesus Christ and him alone. In any ministry that's real, Holy Spirit ministry will glorify Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit will, will, be, will disappear. He'll be minimized. Because that's what he—that's his role, that's his purpose and his function. Even though he's the fullness of the Godhead as much as Jesus Christ is. Complete submission, see? Same thing that's asked of us, right? Self minimized, Christ maximized in our life, same picture. He will take what is mine and declare it to you. So this whole ministry of the Holy Spirit that is, is so wonderful. I wanted to look at, at uh, one other passage in chapter 10 of Hebrews in verse 16, way back at the other end of the New Testament. In Hebrews chapter 10, the writer of Hebrews is, is made reference, he's quoted a long section of Jeremiah 31 in chapter eight. It's probably in italics in your Bible. But in chapter 10, he'll quote just one section of that, Jeremiah 31, the prophecy of the new covenant. The new covenant was fulfilled in Christ's blood. His blood ratifies the new covenant. That's what we celebrate every Lord's Day, right? It's a reminder to us that we are in the new covenant. We are in a covenant relationship with God. He's promised us things because of that. But he says in verse 16, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit in illumination and in teaching and in reminding us of the word of God. And of course, that, that is one of the promises. The second one is their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. So two aspects of the new covenant prophesied. There are other aspects of the new covenant in Jeremiah 31 and in Ezekiel 36 that haven't been fulfilled yet. That won't be fulfilled until the end of the tribulation period when Christ comes back. The land promises to Israel and so forth. The New Testament's very clear. There aren't two new covenants. There aren't four new covenants. One brother called me Years ago, he said, Brother, I, I, people would say there's more than one new covenant. How many new covenants? I said, well, how many old covenants are there? There's only one, the Mosaic covenant, right? And he says in Hebrews, he set aside the first that he may establish the second. He set aside the Mosaic covenant, and only he could do that because he gave it to establish the new covenant. We need to know this because this is the assurance in our hearts that we're building our lives on the truth of God. So come back then to 1 Corinthians. We looked at that last night. So we've seen that there's one message, there's one calling, there's one deliverer, there's one enabler, the Holy Spirit, with a capital E, there's one blesser of the work, the Lord and the Holy Spirit, one temple, one foundation, one spirit who unifies the temple, so enough of this boasting of men. Let's be boasting in God. Right? And that leads Paul then, so he's moved into the message of the cross, that how you were saved in the first place to the Corinthians, and therefore to you and me. And then he brings in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now the ministry of the Holy Spirit, this section in chapter 2, verse 6 to 16, I think is a hinge. It moved back 
to the message of the cross because the understanding of the message of the cross is the work of the Holy Spirit. I didn't read those verses in John 16, but he's the one that convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He does that. You don't have to do that. He does that. And we're totally dependent on him for that, for everyone that gets saved. We can't do it, but he can. We can ask him in prayer, and we should be, right? So if he points back, then he points forward to our spiritual growth, our service and testimony for the Lord while we're still here. And that's what he's going to move into in chapter 3, verse 5, through chapter 4, verse 5. You see, he saved you. But that's not the end goal of salvation. That's just the beginning. He has a purpose for you. He's brought you into this realm, this community, which he calls the body of Christ, his church. He wants you to be involved in that community wherever he places you. He gives you a spiritual gift, wants you to use it, especially within that community, but maybe you'll, depending on the gift, some of that gift can be outside and amongst the unbeliever, especially the gift of evangelism. Right. But let's set up verse 5 of chapter 3 with reading the first four verses. I believe 3, 1 through 4 links better with what preceded in, with regard to the ministry of the Holy Spirit because now he's going to, he talked about the ministry of the Holy Spirit and that's going to bring home to them and their spiritual immaturity, which is the crux of the problem. It'll be the problem in chapter 5. It'll be the problem in chapter 6. It'll be the problem in chapter 7. It'll be the problem in chapter 8, 9, and 10. It'll be the problem with spiritual gifts in 12, 13, and 14. And it'll be a problem with regard to the resurrection in chapter 15. In chapter 15, he'll say that some of you don't even believe in the resurrection. And he'll warn them and say, don't be deceived. Evil associations corrupt good manners. That's in the resurrection chapter. I think that's fascinating. So that tells us what, who were they? As they were associating with people, maybe Jewish evangelists or whatever, that didn't believe in the resurrection. And they were beginning to believe that. And if you don't believe in the resurrection, what are you going to do? You're going to live for this world only. You're going to hoard and storm a bunch of things. And you're going to try to keep from dying just like all the worldlings do going to be scared to death of death like the unbeliever is. I've been in a hospital room when an unbeliever died and I've been in a hospital room when a believer died and they're totally different. This one unbeliever, he, he was struggling just to get his neck, his whole body was shaking. Right down from his toes, his leg, and just, just trying to catch a breath and he was on oxygen. He, his, his lungs were failing. And I had witnessed to him many times. Others had too. And here he is, I mean, just scared of anything just to keep from dying. But maybe the Lord had shown him, look, you put off, you put off, you put off these people that were sharing the gospel. And he saw where he was going. And it scared him to death. I've, I've heard testimonies of people that had a, the Lord gave them a picture of where they were headed. But it was too late. For them according to their testimony so he says verse 1 chapter 3 and I brethren could not speak to you as to spiritual people now this is a sad state of affairs they've been believers for at least three years from 50 51 AD to 55 more than three years for some of them and I couldn't speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. Now, some of the famous theologians from 80 and 90 and 100 years ago described from this portion that, well, there are three different types of people. There are, there's the lost, the natural man in verse 14 of chapter 2. That's the lost man. And then there's a spiritual babe in Christ who is a carnal Christian. And then there's the spiritually mature, growing Christian. Well, I agree with those that say that 
That's a wrong approach. There, there's only two categories. You're either saved or you're lost. And if you're saved, you're supposed to be growing. This third category of a carnal Christian where you can stay a babe in Christ for 50 years, that's not in the Bible. We need to jettison that. <laughs> Throw that out. There are too many people that want to do that. They just want to stay in carnality. Oh, they want their fire insurance certificate. Here it is. Right here. I got my fire I'm not going to hell because I got my fire insurance. I got baptized over there, maybe, and I got my fire insurance certificate. And so. And all you're doing is playing a game with yourself and trying to play a game with God. You may be as lost as a goose. You know what the best assurance of your salvation is? Your ongoing growth in the Lord. The fact that you love him, the fact that you love his word, the fact that you love his people, the fact that you love to gather with his people, the fact that you want to serve him in this world, those all build our assurance. If those aren't there, there's something drastically wrong. Right? I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you're not able to receive it. And even now you're still not able. <laughs> After the ministry of the apostle Paul to him, you're still not able to receive it. For you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Notice he says, he doesn't say you are mere men, as he's called them brethren. But you're behaving like an unbeliever, mere men. You're behaving like an unbeliever. In other words, won't, wouldn't you agree with me that Paul is not satisfied with them remaining in that condition? And if Paul is not satisfied, neither is his Lord, because that's who Paul's speaking for. God, the Father, and Jesus Christ, his Son, is not satisfied with carnal Christianity. With just loping off and waiting for the rapture. That's not part of God. That does not please him. And when we share the gospel with people. And after they receive Christ. We need to be diligent to communicate that to them. Because they're not going to know that. Right? Now they become disciples. And the New, New Testament. The, the Great Commission is be making disciples. Not just new converts. Right? Disciples. And disciples are growing, learning, serving Christians that love the Lord and love his people and love his word. If they're not spending regular time in his word, it challenge them. I mean, graciously and lovingly, but challenge them. I'm so thankful. I look back to the people that challenged me when I was a young Christian. So thankful for them. And I think then I even was, you know, I was a little irritated maybe with first, but, but then was thankful for it, you know? Because there's that, and we could say spiritual laziness, <laughs> I don't know, that, that uh, tendency to not want to cooperate with God and with the Holy Spirit and to, and to resist and keep our foot on the brake pedal when he's pushing the accelerator, you know? And so that leads Paul into verse five. And in 3, 5 through 4, 5, there are four different words he uses to describe. So there are four different pictures that are really helpful to describe service and testimony. Service and testimony. Do you understand what I mean by that? Service is what you do for the Lord. Testimony is how you do it. Your character. Your reputation. So you got to, we think about who you are. He's already told us that in chapter 1, verse 9. You're children of God, brought into the fellowship with his son. What you do, how you do it, and why you do it. God is going to be looking at these things at the judgment seat of Christ because that's going to lead him into this very illuminating section dealing with our giving account to Christ at the judgment seat. And it's very sobering, but it's very important. 
And young believers need to be taught this because they're not going to imagine it. I have not seen, the ear heard. It hasn't even entered the heart of man to think God is prepared. And they need to be taught. So you have to have a, if, if you led someone to the Lord, if I lead someone to the Lord, I feel an obligation, if I'm not in the same city where they are, to still do follow-up. Maybe by contacting a Christian in that city to, to meet with them or to call them directly. There's different ways you can do it. But if you have the, the privilege of leading someone from death to life, you've got a responsibility too, I think, to make sure that they move on in spiritual growth. They won't know to do these things because that's, that's the way it is in this world. So Paul says in verse 5, who then is Paul? Well, let me just point out to you the four words that he uses here. And then we won't get to all four tonight. I think I'll get to the first two tonight. But you notice the word minister in verse 5. Who is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers. And that's the word diakonos. We get our word deacon from it. And it's the general word for servant. Probably the word for servant most used in the Bible. You realize if you pull out your concordance that there are some seven or eight different Greek words that translate into our one word servant. That's how rich the Greek language is. And so the second word he uses in verse nine, we are God's fellow workers. If your Bible says laborers, that, that's even a better word and it's a compound word soon ergos fellow workers can you imagine the privilege of that being a fellow worker with god we're going to look at that a little bit and then in chapter 4 verse 1 you see in my bible servants of christ there in the first part of the the verse well that is a different word uber ates, which it is really some of your versions may translate under rower Say, well, what in the world's an under rower? Well, maybe you've seen pictures of it in back in the first century days of a galley ship. You know, the big ships they had, they had sails on them, but they were sometimes in areas where the wind wasn't blowing or if they're in a harbor where they had to go slower and they, they had these oars going out the side, right? You've seen those pictures where all these long oars are going out the side of the hull and there were benches inside where those oars came in and there were men that were slaves that were sitting on those benches and they were oaring in the galley ship. And it's a great picture word and we're gonna talk about that probably tomorrow night, what it can tell us, but one thing it tells, there was only one commander. And we have only one commander and captain too, don't we? What would it be like if one of those oarsmen, if they're all going forward and the commander said, go forward, so much to such a speed and they're going, and one of them says, you know what, I want to go this way. Is that going to work? Well, he says, all right, backward now. Now we've got to go backward. We're backing up in the harbor. And one of them says, no, I'm going to go this way. A disobedient servant. Well, that's what Paul's trying to, he's trying to say, Paulos, Apollos and Paul and Cephas, we're all going the same direction. We have one commander. We're all in this together, going the same direction, following the same orders. We'll look at that more as we say when we get to it. And then the, the fourth word uh, is, is the second one used in verse 1 of chapter 4, and that's the word steward, which is a household manager, or economia. It, it's used several times in the Bible, and we can all understand that. A, a household manager that's responsible for the goods and property of the particular master he's serving. Okay? Those are the four words he uses to communicate to these Corinthians that their service and testimony is part of the plan of God for them. All right. So let's go back to verse five. <laughs> Modern technology. That's all right, brother. I could easily have. Back to chapter three, verse five. The first word is ministers. And you notice he'll describe their ministry is in God's field. You see that in verse nine? Now this is a literary technique. I hope it doesn't bother you that God likes to have color in his literature and the word of God. 
is so much color and I love to see it. So what he does in verse nine, he uses two phrases, God's field and God's building. You see that? God's field refers back from chapter five, uh, verse five to verse nine of chapter three. I'll show you how that works. And then God's building goes from verse 10 to verse 17, okay? So verse nine looks back to the previous verses and looks forward to the verses that follow. You say, well, why didn't you say God's field in verse five? Well, he could have, but he's doing it this way. <laughs> and I'm glad. It's not a systematic theology. I'm so glad there's rich variety in, in the word of God. So it's particularly minister or servant in a field. So think of it this way. A farmer, he has fields where he's growing crops and he has certain field laborers, right? That's who we are. That's all we are. So he's trying to show these Corinthian Christians who are all trying to exalt a certain man, who their favorite teacher is and all that. And Paul's using these words to bring them right down. <laughs> no, there's only one owner of the field and that's God. It's God's field. But he says, who then is Paul? Who then is Apollos, but ministers, servants, through whom you believe? What does that mean? Through whom they were instruments. Through whom they were a vehicle. They were an instrument through whom the Corinthians believed. See? As who gave to each one? Did Paul give life to each one? Did Apollos? Who's in charge? The Lord is, right? The Lord gave to each one. Each one, Paul has his assignment. Peter has his assignment. John has his assignment. Apollo has his assignment. Timothy has his assignment. You have your assignment. I have my assignment. We're all workers in this field. It's God's field. We're workers in it, and we want to work together, right? I planted Apollo's water. Two different roles, two different responsibilities, but who gets the credit for the increase? Neither of them. Does that bother you? I read missionary letters and maybe I'm too critical of our dear missionaries sometimes, but the flesh, that evil side of us is so subtle. I noticed that some missionaries They'll put it in the form of a prayer request to exalt themselves. Now they're exalting themselves, but they'll put it in the form, I'm only telling you all this information about me and how great I am, so you'll pray for me in this particular endeavor. Well, that's carnality. And you, and you know what reward they're gonna get for that? Nothing. And it indicates spiritual immaturity. Now, it doesn't indicate a permanent state of it unless they stay in that condition. If they did, I'd pull them off the field and bring them back and say, you need to sit in the meeting and grow first. You went to the field too soon. A lot of people go to the field too soon. Lay hands suddenly on no man, Paul says in 1 Timothy 5. You know, that, that can be a real problem. There's got to be spiritual growth. One of the brothers who later became an elder down in Hollywood Chapel tells a story that uh, when he was first saved, uh, he, he, he was a rough, he was involved in the mob up in Brooklyn and he got beat up real bad. And, but the Lord saved him. And he had been an alcoholic even before he got saved. Well, he, he stopped all of that and everything, but he still had a little problem with language. <laughs> and, and he was volunteering. He said, well, I'll drive, I'll drive the bus for, to pick up the kids. They had a bus ministry. I'll drive the bus. And, and something came up and bloop, he let out one of his words. And one of the elders said, oh no, he needs to sit in the meeting. He needs to be in the meeting. He doesn't need to be out there. He needs to be in the meeting for a while. Let him grow a little first. Later on, 
in time he did. He and his wife had a great part with the youth group and the bus ministry. But you see, wise eldership, don't put him out there where he's going to fail, right? It isn't a younger Christian will say, oh, you're just restricting me. You're not allowing me to be what I want to be. You're not allowing me to exercise my gift. No, we're trying to save you from being a flop for Christ. Because a young Christian doesn't understand. I didn't either. I'm not picking on him. I was there. We all were there. We don't understand the big picture of things and we need to grow. And that's what was happening here. I mean, they were stunted growth Christians. They were born again. He calls them brethren. But they were stunted growth. And that is not normal. <laughs> That's not the normal Christian life. That's what that false theology out there from 80 years ago implied. Well, that's a normal state for some Christian. It's not. It's not a normal state for any Christian. It is an abnormal state to continue in permanent babyhood. Okay? Just like it is, you would say that even in the physical realm, wouldn't we? We would if someone stayed in that kind of condition. Unless there was some sort of malady, you know, physical malady. We know that can happen. But God gave the increase. So then, verse 7, the summary, neither he who plants, Paul, is anything. Whoa. And what did they just, I am of Paul? I'm of a Paul. Paul says, he who plants has died anything, nor he who waters. Bible teacher comes along afterward. Paulos was a gifted Bible teacher. The word tells us that. Eloquent in speech. The word tells us that. And he came along and swept a bunch of people off their feet. And they said, wow, I'm a follower of Apollos. Well, he brought him into deeper truth. He, and later, Apollos is ashamed of this because you know how I know this hold your finger here and go back to chapter go to chapter 16 at the end of the letter Paul's dealing with several different matters in chapter 16 after the resurrection chapter in chapter 15 and he mentions I love this he, he almost mentions it just in passing now verse 12 now concerning our brother Apollos I strongly, and, and this is a loving thing of the Apostle Paul, I strongly urge him to come to you with the brethren. So there were brethren coming, making a trip to Corinth, and he says, Paul, you need to go with us. <coughs> Isn't that great? Paul isn't trying to say, hey, that's my work. I planted that church. I know missionaries that have run off, missionaries that came after them because, hey, I planted that work. That's mine. Or planted that assembly. That's my assembly. It isn't yours. It's Christ's. You didn't die for anybody. You didn't, you didn't shed one drop of blood. And if you did, it wouldn't have done anything for him except get him dirty. Right? <laughs> get him with germs. So he says, Apollos, I urge him to come. But he was quite unwilling to come at this time. Oh, oh, oh. I'll say, it. if I were him, I'd be, whoa, no. After the first, if, Paul, if Apollos got to read this letter, no, I'm not touching that. I'm staying over here in Ephesus for a while. But he didn't rule it out completely. However, he will come when he has a convenient time. <laughs> I love it. In other words, Apollos recognized the authority of God ministering through the Apostle Paul. And Apollos realized maybe, I said maybe, he was at least partly the cause, because of his eloquent speech, of this party division factionalism that was happening, okay? So he doesn't want to foster it more by going back there and saying, wait a minute, you know, I've got a following there. They gave me a big gift. No, he didn't say that. But, you know, I've heard people talk like that. People in the ministry, like I know. Oh, they gave so I no, no. God gave the increase. So verse 7, it's neither he who plants is anything and he who waters, but God who gives the increase. You see in verse 6 and 7, he's saying the same thing about God twice right in a row. That's a mild rebuke. Okay? Repetition. When your teacher in school repeats the same word two sentences in a row, 
or your mommy repeats the same word, then they're, they're giving you a mild rebuke. They're not hitting you. That's next. <laughs> he'll, he'll talk about that at the end of chapter 4, verse 21, with regard to the rod. But he's been giving them a mild rebuke here. He's wanting them to respond to it. Now, he who plants and he who waters are one. Not two. Not five. Not 25. One. This whole exaltation of man thing, it's subtle in how we do conferences and uh, conference announcements. I, I think Dan probably remembers the day, some of you other brethren remember the day, when, when the assemblies would have a conference, they wouldn't say who was speaking. They wouldn't know. Because you're not coming for the speaker, you're coming for the word of God, you're coming for the Lord and the word of God, and you're trusting the elders or the people in charge of the conference to have people that are in fellowship with the Lord, right? And can handle the word. But nowadays, people evaluate whether they go to the workers and elders or whether they go to this Rise Up conference and all these conferences. Well, so-and-so speaking. You ever done that? Shame on you. I've done it too. Shame on me. Stop this boasting in men. That's what Paul says. Because that, that's going to foster carnality. We need to see it's God that's at work. The Holy Spirit isn't giving his illumination. You see why that whole section on the Holy Spirit sets this up? If the Holy Spirit's not at work, then you waste your time. I mean, maybe you'll have a good time in the Ozarks if it's, that's where the conference is and get some good food and everything. But as far as spiritual growth, there won't be the benefit if the Holy Spirit's not at work. Amen? So it's not him, you plants or you waters. And, and then you notice in verse 8, he introduces the idea of reward. Now he's going to give us a lot more information about that in the, in the next description that he gives. Each one, notice that, each one will receive his own or her own reward according to how popular they are with the brethren. Is that what it says? According to, it doesn't even say according to how many souls got saved. You notice that? Or it doesn't say according to how many people said thank you for the message, if that's what the person was doing. According to their labor. Hmm. He's going to talk about that labor in the next description that he uses. So it's not just who you are, it includes who you are, you've got to be saved, right? The message of the cross. How you do the work, that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit, all working together as one, looking to God to give the increase. What you do is according to your assignment from the King, the Lord Jesus, and then you'll get into why you do it, your motives. Your motives for ministry. You realize, in and, and all of this is going to be greatly expanded in chapters 5 through 15. That's why I see that all of this is an introduction to what follows. You realize what he says in the great love chapter that we like to read at weddings? That love chapter is, is about motive for service. I mean, you serve in, in a married couple, right? So then you can apply it that way. But in its primary context, it's about service amongst Christians in the assembly. The whole chapter. And he says something there. He says, even if someone goes to a foreign mission field and gives their body to be burned in martyrdom, and they didn't do it with the motive of love, you know how much it's going to profit him? Nothing. Nothing. They may get a park named after him in that country or in this country or a street named after him, but all that's going to perish anyway here in this world. You see how God wants us to see it? Everything I do 
for the Lord. I need, and that's where self-examination comes in, and he's going to talk about that. Well, that's what he talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, right? Let a man and woman examine themselves before they take into elements. That whole idea of self-examination, he introduces it here. So that brings us to verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers, or fellow laborers, only here the fellow workers are working in building a structure that he calls the temple. So now he's shifting the metaphor from being workers in a field, a field laborer, to being a laborer with God in building a spiritual temple. And so he says, you are God's field, that looks back to verses five through eight, and you are God's building. You see how God is three times in verse nine? <laughs> God, God, God. And so that leads in verse 10, according to the grace of God, which was given to me, which means Paul can't take credit for it, right? As a wise master builder, the Greek word, we get our word ar architecton, we get our word architect. As a wise architect or builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. In this case, Apollos, right? So I've laid the foundation. He's talking about a new work in Corinth, planting a church. But you see how he's shifting the metaphor. Now he's talking about the foundation of a building. I've laid the foundation of the building, and then others are building on that. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. You see, God is not just concerned that we're busy serving, but how we serve is important to God. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid already, which is Jesus Christ. So what's he saying? The message of the cross, chapter 1. I came in, I brought the message of the cross. I laid the foundation by proclaiming Jesus Christ died for you according to the scriptures, raised again according to the scriptures, ascended, and he's building his church. You see, along with this, you could put Matthew 16, 18. Remember what, what the Lord told the group there with that Caesarea Philippi? I will build. So who's doing the building? Christ. Not the Pope. Not some bishop or an elder. Christ is doing, I will build my church. Not yours. My church. Not, it doesn't belong to any elders. It's my church. I gave my blood for it. Acts chapter 20. Right? And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But we are fellow laborers now with the Lord. Christ is building his church from heaven. He sent the Holy Spirit. Pentecost. Acts chapter 2. And spirit filled believers are cooperating, participating, partnering with the master of the universe, Jesus Christ, in building his church. Now, would you agree with me that it's the highest calling on earth? Is there any, any calling higher than that? No way, right? There are other callings that are good callings, but nothing higher than that. For no other foundation can anyone else lay. So now he goes on to how we build. Verse 12. If anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work. You notice each one's work at the beginning of verse 13 and each one's work at the end of verse 13. In verse 14, anyone's work. Verse 15, anyone's work. That's just the law of observation, no? just observing the text, right? That helps to see what the subject is. So if anyone builds on this foundation, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it. What day? The day of Christ. He's already talked about that in chapter 1 and verse 8, right? The day of Christ. The, the judgment seat will follow right at that time. will declare it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test 
each one's work what sort it is. I'm running out of time, so I, I won't I won't go back there, but I, I wanted to, and so maybe tomorrow night we'll look at a verse in the Old Testament that I think the Holy Spirit has in mind here. But let's just say this much, and we'll conclude with that tonight. In fire, gold, so, I mean, I know none of you are probably metallurgists or jewelers, you know, so maybe you haven't done this, but you probably know if you take gold, silver, or precious stone, diamonds, let's say, and you put them in fire, what happens to them? Does it destroy them? No, oh, it purifies them, makes them even more special. But if I take some of that Kansas hay that I just put in a big haystack out there in the field, and I bring that in, put that in that fire, what happens to that hay? Nothing. And that's what he says is going to happen to some born-again Christians because they made some bad decisions and set some bad priorities, became worldly, were happy to stay carnal, not cooperate with the Holy Spirit, not grow and participate in God's work. They won't, he clearly says they won't lose their salvation, but they'll have nothing to show for it when they see the Lord Jesus. I can't imagine to look at you and say, I gave you 55 years, let's say, on this earth to serve me. You got nothing to show for? Is that what you want your life to be? That would be a sad thing, wouldn't it? I don't want that for any of you. I don't want that for me. But we have a lot to do with it, right? In terms of responsibility. Each one's work will be tested. So how you do the work, the fact that you do the work, the what question, what work will I do, and why do I do it, or what motive? First and primary motive, my love for the Lord Jesus, because he died for me. My second motive, my love for the person I'm serving. It doesn't matter what kind of service you're doing. You're working in the kitchen and sweating outside that stove or cleaning the bathrooms or working the vacation Bible school or working with Sunday school or cleaning and mowing the yard. Maybe nobody knows what you're doing. Don't complain. That means you got rich rewards because if you get your reward here, if you say, well, I, I wish so-and-so, and they come, they oh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to put your name up here and, and declare a day, a Sunday, or, the Lord said, you just got your reward. Enjoy it. You won't get it again at the Bama. You just got it. That's in Matthew chapter 6, right? Stay as quiet about it as you can. <laughs> I've been there too. Did you know I did? Stay as quiet about it as you can and save it for later. It takes faith to do that, right? Because you got to believe that the Lord Jesus is not going to forget and he's not going to forget, is he? As he says in Hebrews, will he forget your labor of love and your sacrifice for the saints? No, he won't. That's a powerful chapter and a powerful truth to get and as a young Christian, isn't it? I wish I had been brought, taught more clearly of that. In the first five years I was saved, it took, took a while for me. I don't want that to be, I want these young people to make those priorities early on and all of us for the Lord's glory, amen? So, Brother Dan, if you close in prayer, we're so honored to have you here, brother. And thank the Lord, I guess, for Lane's dear child. Thank you, Lord.